Hi everyone, uh, I'm James. Um, I apologize for being remote, wish I could make it there. The scheduling just didn't work out. Um, I am presenting along with my colleague, David Woodhouse. Uh, we are kernel and hypervisor engineers in EC2, um, you know, specifically working on the virtualization aspects of EC2. And this is kind of perhaps a bit poorly or confusingly titled, but we are basically, it's kind of an RFC presentation discussing some options for making guest memory and state uh, be able to be persisted and recreated or restored uh, after live update. Um, specifically live update is a K exec and doing this in the presence of some um, virtualization requirements like being able to do device pass through memory of a subscription and uh, some other virtualization aspects which we'll go into um yeah so roughly we'll go in, going through problem and requirements implementation options comparison steps and then have a discussion afterwards and i'm most keen to have the discussion and get people's opinions on this so fundamentally a live update of a hypervisor is done via a k-exec where the uh, state of the virtual machines is serialized. Uh, a K exec is then done into the new version of the hypervisor user space VMM processes started up. The uh, guest state deserialized and then the virtual machines are allowed to run, basically pick up from where they left off. And we need to persist guest memory across this K exec basically. So that when they pick up after the K exec, they can get save memory state, yeah. And that basically, as far as I can tell, implies that this memory can't be um, kernel managed in the traditional sense, um, that uh, yeah, it, it needs to be managed separately and we'll kind of go into options for that. We also need to be able to support memory of a commit where we can, um, using some sort of a control process, be able to reclaim pages from an instance or a guest virtual machine and and kind of put them somewhere else like a swap out workflow or be able to reclaim using when there are balloon reports of um, free page reports those sort of things um yes yeah, so that's another sort of requirement here and also the ability to support sidecar virtual machines where uh, uh, guests can donate a portion of its memory to run a another virtual machine um, and also be able to deliver page faults to user space for example if doing post copy live migration or in the case of a swap workflow if you need to swap in a page that has been swapped out and another requirement for device pass through is to be able to hand over slices a small section of pci bars to virtual machines. So these are kind of the constraints that we're looking at um, how to solve something that handles these various uh, requirements uh, for guest memory and the, uh, these other aspects. Um, so, so yeah, as I mentioned, we the guest memory is probably, it should not be touched by the new kernel. So something like a mem a kernel command line parameter to carve out a large portion of the uh, host memory space for guest memory and only have the kernel ma man manage a small portion of it. We also need to um, play nicely with something like user fault FD for faults. Uh, only anonymous memory is supported currently with user fault FD, I believe. So uh, need to figure out how to do that if we are not using anonymous kernel managed memory. And I think I've mentioned, I mentioned the PCI pass already. The yeah, there's this kind of, there's this requirement for basically a privileged process to be able to do mandatory access control on the guest memory where, for example, when spawning sidecar VMs or when um, carving or, or when doing something like a swap workflow, we need to be able to remove pages from the guest memory space and, and treat the the VMM process as essentially an untrusted process. So a control process needs to have mandatory access control to modify the guest um, memory mappings. 
And also just note that we don't need struct pages for any of this. Um, there's already been work that's done upstream to remove the need for struct pages for much of the um, KVM guest um, memory maps. Some other things to keep in mind. Um, IOMMU mappings need to be kept in sync with user space mappings as guest memory is reclaimed through something like a um, uh, memory over subscription component, IMMU or map back in. The IMMU also needs to be kept in sync. And also, IMMU page tables need to persist so that DMA can be kept running uh, during the K exec process. And just a, another uh, potential use case is to be able to do faster K execs by passing state between the old kernel and the new kernel. So these are the, this is kind of the, what we're looking at developing a solution to solve. Specifically, we want to you know, develop something upstream to solve this. So before I move on to possible implementations, are there any questions on or, or clarifications on the, the problem, what we're trying to actually do here? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, one small question. The, sure. The previous slide maybe said uh, you don't need struct, yeah, no struct pages are required. Does it also imply that you don't need any R mapping? Yes, that is correct. Um, I think that in fact, with the TDP MMU, R mapping was completely removed if I'm correct. So yeah, that's not necessary. Essentially, we can treat all of this as PFN map memory. Okay, thanks. I was just trying to see if there was overlap with something else. And Sure. I'm going to shrink this thing. Okay. I'm not sure how to make the side go away. Um, okay. Any other? Yeah. Unfortunately, I can't see you. So anyone feel free to interrupt at any point. Okay. So now let's get on to some possible implementation options for ways that we're thinking of doing this. So one option is to basically use something like a fully fledged file system. And by a fully fledged file system, I mean uh, files, a file system in the kernel that is responsible for doing page allocations, all these sort of things like a traditional file system does, but on this reserve chunk of memory, uh, which the kernel is not managing. So have a, a file system manage that. And just like any file system, it would keep data about which pages for which files have been allocated where on that memory. And you could potentially mount this or create a file system on top of a, like a DAX device or supply command line parameters or something, kind of command line parameters to indicate, okay, this file system needs to work on this um, reserved large chunk of memory. And then the files in this file system could be used for guest memory. And this is probably just something like PKRAM on top of DAX. Um, PKRAM patches, I think, were posted uh, again last year sometime, but I haven't seen much movement on them. So I'm not sure what the status on top of, P of PKRAM is. It is. If we try to do something like PKRAM on top of DAX, it, it's not too clear to me how we would do something like other sorts of memory like PCI bars. If we need to pass through a, a portion of PCI bar space, how do you convince this file system to be able to do that? Struggling to see that. Also, the mandatory access control kind of aspects of this, where we want to carve out a chunk of the memory of a guest and use that to spawn another guest or to be able to map portions to scratch page or to trigger some sort of user space driven swap workflows if a portion of this file is accessed the the kind of file system semantics here i think we would struggle with it's not clear how we would do those kind of mandatory access control parts if we had a kernel the kernel fully managing this file system itself So that's, yeah, that's the one option. 
that we're looking at. The other is to to get the kernel to do less of the file system work itself and rather punt it to user space through something like a fuse um, protocol. But instead of fuse today is kind of in the data path where it needs to move the actual get the data for the read and write um, operations on files. But instead of that, it would rather do something like when a guest tries to access a portion of this file, it would bubble up something like a fault to user space and say, you know, this portion of this new file, so this file has tried to be accessed, what would you like to do? And then user space could say, I would like to map it to this PFN or something like that um, basically yeah so you still have a sort of file system interface with files but uh, the actual mappings and allocations and which part of which file is backed by which memory page would be that sort of decision would be made by a user space control process in this case user space either needs to probably user space needs to keep track of where all the mappings are um, in other words, which um, parts of which file correspond to which bit of memory so that after kexec, once you've done your live updates uh, and those files start getting accessed again, user space can replay those same mappings into the, into the kernel so that the same memory can be provided. Um, where was I on my... Yeah, and the control process would also then be able to do these kind of more uh, advanced things that you would struggle to do with the first sort of fully fledged file system operation where the control process could tell the file system, you know, uh, unmap this page. If it gets accessed again, we need to trigger a swap in workflow. And it would probably also do things like um, part do. PCI bars, where if a portion of a file is accessed, this user space fuse sort of thing could say, well, you need to back this now by a particular PCI um, IOMM address, basically, and, and set that set those mappings up. So that would then be set up in the PFN mapped uh, page tables. Maybe the allocations could be persisted in the file system itself, as in keeps some metadata um, about allocations. Maybe everything would just be recreated from user space after live update, not sure. Um, the, the thing that makes me a bit nervous about saying, okay, we're going to keep all of this, keep the, the allocations inside the kernel, inside this file system, means that if you want to add new node types, uh, you need to have things like translators to be able to do rollbacks, roll forwards, uh, and that kind of gets a bit hairy. So passing that, that sort of state from one kernel to another is a bit could be a bit hairy and perhaps just getting user space to read to re-inject those mappings is the way to go. And now the third option is something like much more like a raw memory device, a character device with just file descriptors, no file system involved, just raw FDs, something like a dev mem FD or even a mem FD. FD. Um, they could be initialized or instantiated with uh, backing memory and that backing memory could either could be something like a, a DAX device or even dev mem or a PCI bar or something like that and then the control process could do IO controls onto that file descriptor and say on the on the file descriptor that gets handed to a particular virtual machine and say uh, which offsets in that file descriptor correspond to which actual host PFNs. So in a way, it's kind of similar to the fuse option in that user space is basically programming in mappings saying uh, which uh, host physical addresses back which aspects of which um, parts of a file, but instead of a, instead of actually having a file system interface, you just have a FD. It's, yeah, so it's, it's possibly easier to um, do this without kind of having the constraints of a file system. Uh, just having raw FDs mean you can have a new device type and things like that instead of having to work in inside the constraints of a, 
of a file system style interface. Uh, once again, user space would need to persist mappings across KEXEC so that it could uh, re-inject the same mappings after uh, when those files start get access, those FDs start getting accessed again. And this is something that we have, um, we're running and have built using this interface, uh, but it is very tailored at the moment to this one particular use case that we have, and it is a bit clumsy kind of passing file descriptors around. So we're looking, you know, exploring other options um, for how we can actually build something upstream to support this live update use case. Okay, any questions so far before we start looking at kind of comparison between these approaches? Yeah, so maybe I have one question. Uh, so, so you are speaking now about restoring mappings and stuff like that, but after KXEC, you have to restore perhaps also other stuff like you know, open files and similar things. Yeah. So, how, how, like to me, it kind of resembles basically checkpoint restart <laughs> that, that already exists, where basically they, they want to se basically save all the system state, like all the open file descriptor or set up, you know, pipes, perhaps even networking connections and stuff like that and then restore it, like they do restore it in another container or in another virtual machine, basically. Here you want to restore it in the same, on the same machine, just a different kernel, but still the principle seems to be very similar. So I'm kind of wondering what are the intersections here? Sure, yeah, so um, I think one of, the, one of the things that sounds different to what you're describing here is that we're not trying to kind of um, get, get everything recreated automatically. The idea is to k-exec into a completely sort of fresh kernel, restart all of the user space processes that then need to come and open their files again, create their, their um, KVM virtual machines again, all that sort of stuff. So you really are kind of creating everything from scratch but what you want to do is allow those virtual machines to pick up from where they left off in terms of having the same um, memory and uh, yeah, the, the same memory. So the way we think about live update is it's like live migration in time instead of space, right? Instead of moving the state of that machine and all its memory to a different host and starting up a new VMM on the new host, you basically k-exec into a new kernel and complete set of files, you know, complete file system and new version of the VMM, et cetera, on the same host, and then just pick up your state from memory. And, you know, it's like completing the live migration from there. So there are no file descriptors, no user space state. There is, in this particular case, there isn't any networking at all. We don't build config net um, because it's all passed through devices. Um, so there's nothing of, that kind, nothing of the checkpoint restore style thing to be moved across. Team, okay, thanks. So, so is, yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Are the guests doing like the equivalent of a sus suspend the K exec resume? So the guests are actually mostly oblivious to this. The, the process, um, the, the guests get paused, state serialized, stashed somewhere in this persistent memory that we're talking about, which is not kernel managed. And then after k-exec, KVM VMs are created fresh, but then that state such as vCPU state, you know, where all the registers are and everything gets re-injected back into KVM. And then that vCPU gets resumed from basically exactly the instruction pointer where it was left off. So other than a short pause for when the actual k-exec happens and the user space process is all restarted, the VMM processes basically, the guest is unaware of this um, uh, live update. It basically experiences some stale time like it might in live migration. Um, but yeah, a little bit more, unfortunately, but we're working on that. But that ties into the other thing that we spoke of as sort of future work, right? Um, we talked about a way to pass information from one kernel to the next. Now, any driver or subsystem 
could theoretically just pass a blob of information, sort of like a, a bit of a device tree, maybe, um, to the incarnation of that same driver in the next kernel. The classic one is loops for Jiffy, right? Um, why bother recalibrating when you can just be told? Um, and any driver can be given sort of, this is the exact state of your hardware that I left it in for you a half a second ago. Um, and it can treat that as a, an, an opaque blob for that driver. And it can decide that it wants to consume that. And hey, I don't have to go and reinitialize hardware. I don't have to go and enumerate what disks are on the other side of it. Or it can decide to throw it away and say, screw it, I don't trust that old kernel. I'm going to go and reinitialize for myself. So you can actually get the pause time down quite significantly by doing tricks like that, um, which may or may not eventually tie into stuff that we want to persist from one KXX to the next. But we were trying not to go down that rat hole too far right now. Yeah, trying to keep, keep this just uh, sort of simpler, comparatively simpler initially, like how do we get guest memory within all these virtualization constraints across? Okay. Um, any other questions before we, well, I guess I'll just keep going. But yeah, as I say, feel free to interrupt. So just looking at these different options here. So the nice thing about having the sort of fully fledged file system in the kernel is all your allocations, mappings, whatever are done by kernel. You don't need to switch to user space. You get the advantages of you know a file system, which is really nice. You can see all your sort of guest memory files, um, use file system semantics and if this all these all the state and allocations and mappings and everything are persisted within the kernel in this persistent memory, it can be available immediately after K exec without needing to reprogram any mappings from user space. But the more advanced cases like how to do mandatory access control, deliver page faults, uh, PCI bars, IMMU page tables, this I think becomes a lot more complicated and unclear how to do. With the few star file system, we you're pushing more messages and more control to user space. Uh, there's a better path to be able to get PCI bars and uh, faults across to user space that it can then make decisions about. Although it could still be diff difficult to get some of the mandatory access control uh, logic or um, yeah, you know, interfaces, I suppose, convincing your file system to do this kind of stuff using traditional file system semantics. The raw memory device, where we move away from file, the file system completely and just use file descriptors, it's probably the most um, flexible custom device, um, IO controls, all that sort of thing. Um, but I think the main disadvantage uh, and we're not bound by file system semantics, which it's got, you know, pros and cons, basically. Um, but I think the main disadvantage is that we have to pass file descriptors around and we lack the introspectability of the file system. Yeah, so those are kind of the options we're thinking about. Advantages and disadvantages of each. Um, we also need to think about what we're going to do with this IMMU remapping. So the best of my knowledge, it's still, it's still the case that if you um, do device pass through using VFI, it causes, causes all the memory to be pinned. And that's um, if we want to do this kind of dynamic memory stuff um, <clears throat> where we can reclaim pages from virtual machines and map them back in later, uh, we need IMMU dynamic remappings as well, where the user space page tables and the IMMU page tables are kept in sync. I almost think that's kind of an orthogonal thing that we need to solve somehow, although it is also a you know, requirement here that we need to figure out some, some approach for. Um, uh, hi, here is David. So, um for VFL, IO, MMU, um, you might want to take a look at RUDOMM. RUDOMM is able to reconfigure that, but it's it's something different than your traditional three page reporting or something like that. It's like really to add and remove memory from a virtual machine, and it is able to reprogram then like the IO, MMU. So um, maybe that gives you some clue what you might or might not yeah. want to do. J just a heads up. Okay, that's great. So VertiMM can actually reprogram. You're saying that the host um, IMMU when when pages are add are uh, removed. Exactly, yeah. Like you, like you, 
you es essentially have like some car a kind of a sparse memory area that you expose to a virtual machine, but you program mm -hmm. the I.O. MMU only for the parts that actually have semantics for the guest, which means like the parts that are actually currently usable by the guest. And um, okay. can you update the I.O. MMU? Uh, the downside is that you have to do that like in some kind of chunks because I think you can only have a maximum of 64K mappings in VFIO IO MMU. So like that's, that sets some limit on how many like different mappings can you actually have and what will be the granularity in which you can add or remove memory from a virtual machine. Okay, so this is actually operating in these chunks. Okay, yeah. You see, if we're doing this kind of individual page level thing, I, I suspect we'll need a more granular interface, but uh, that'll definitely be interesting to look at just to see how that's done. Um, okay, just carrying on here. So, so obviously we need to kind of decide on what approach we're going to attempt to build here, um, work with uh, upstream collaborators to try and um, you know, to develop something here. Uh, just as a straw man, like the Fuse style file system, with doing raw PFN mappings from user space, uh, that seems like maybe the most appealing way to do it. And yeah, we would like to get a RFC patch series together uh, in the kind of coming months, based on what we what we think here at least is the is the good approach to pursue, and hopefully later this year present some more polished patches and approaches at KVM Forum. Yeah, so that's what I have. I'll open the floor for comments and feedback. I have some ideas for feedback here. Um, but yeah, open the floor to questions. I'll at least cop, cop to um, looking at the PK RAM patches and then saying why to myself and then coyly going away without saying anything on the list. Um, the fuse and the raw device options seem less scary. They seem like, okay, I can, I can re review this, the, the small semantics that are needed on the kernel side and the rest of the use case and complexity can be pushed to user space. So that sounds appealing at first glance, but yeah. Uh, personally, I was, I was I, 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 yeah, scared away by the complexity of PK RAM. I, yeah, I also took a skim through those patches. Um, did you have, does anyone happen to know what the story with PK RAM is? It, it seems pretty quiet. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have any details, but I, I assume like when they sent it the last time, we weren't especially sparking with joy. Like there was basically not really feedback because the issue with anything like that and also what you're discussing, it is very, very specific to like big cloud vendors that do, do like very advanced stuff, so to say. Um, which of course, uh, like the more complicated it gets, the harder it is for us to digest it, if you get what I mean. Mm. And PKRAM was like in my humble opinion, something like that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. One of the things we're looking at trying to simplify, right? The concept of, you know, fuse for DAX, that's something that simple and I, I it would you know you can imagine that we will find plenty of other sensible use cases for that that are not just applicable to big cloud vendors right yeah, and, we have yeah and that was one of my DAX, somebody who's done DAX support for fuse I think this is Vivek right Maybe not exactly what you want, but at least, at least I know somebody's looking at DAX support for Fuse. That'll be a good start. Thanks. That's great. D David, did you catch that name? I didn't. I, 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 I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to get the wrong person, but I think it's v Vivek Goya from Red Hat. If somebody wants to okay, know. thank you. I saw him online on the, on the MM Summit earlier, but not, not now. Yeah, so I'm just on that topic, you know, the kind of use case specific thing. Yeah, that, that was one of my sort of points that I was keen to solicit feedback from the room here. You know, are there other, the, this sort of infrastructure, has it got other uses that we should keep in mind? Because we would obviously prefer not to build something that's very, very use case specific. Uh, 
I mean, like, usually whenever you talk about virtual machines, the other big use case is databases because they have some very, a lot of stuff in common. So I would, would be wondering, for example, if you can use something like that for very big in-memory databases. Because, like, I, I, I've heard of some setups where, like, it takes them, I think, 12 hours or so to boot the machine and to load all the data, or even longer. Of course, if you can do a live update on such a machine with whatever, 12 terabyte or even more, you might have quite some significant benefit. Um, but, but I guess that would then be the, a question for our database folks. Yeah, now, we've kind of carefully tried to pick out the live update parts here. You know, I talked about it a bit earlier um, and try to keep things separate. But yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's not just Checkpoint Restore. Um, across live update, but there's a whole bunch of other things we can do to, to speed that up. Um, some of the big database platforms also just take minutes in writing disks. That's one of the other things we can, we can clean up, for example. Um, so yeah, we have definitely started looking at that um, internally as well, as sort of from the point of view of what is something we want to build into the guest kernel for, for people to use on that kind of platform. So yeah, it, it was Vivek, and he's working on something called Vert, Vert, uh, Vert IOFS and then DAX support for Vert IOFS, which, I, which is based on Fuse, I believe. Vert IOFS, OK. So that would be, uh, what is this? OK, so file system semantics, but that's to the guest, right? So the guest would be able to access a file system that is backed by a Vert IO channel. Something like that. Okay. So I think <laughs> what what they're hacking on is that you, like, like virtual FS is to speed up um, file access in your virtual machine, and it tries to avoid the page cache. And what they're thinking about is, sh I think, sharing the page cache between the hypervisor and the guest in in a DAX area. Meaning, like DAX here, meaning I think you have. Uh, um, a PCI bar that exposes that to the guest operating system and wh whatever is there mm -hmm. can then like access, access faster, so something along those lines. And I think there's some kind of tech support for that, but uh, I also have like not too much knowledge about yeah. that part. I think this sounds a bit quite, this sounds different, right? I mean, we're not trying to use. I, th I, I, I don't think it is. I don't think it's importantly different. The point is, Vert.io FS is implemented in user space, right? The kernel provides Fuse for DAX, um, um, or DAX support for Fuse, basically. And so, yes, there are implementations of a kernel, of a user space thing, which presumably has a VFIO connection to Vert.io to, to talk to file system protocol, and then just tells the kernel, here, yeah, you want that page from this file? It's it's at, at this PFN, and that that's the key, right? We would go and write some other user space thing that comes up with other answers, but I think this is the kernel side of what we need, of at least the basis of it, and we need to look at the precise revoke semantics. That's the the key part, mm. right? Um, but yeah, this this is a good start. Yeah, I think. Okay, I believe I'm out of time. Any other any last questions or observations? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, James.